Fantastic. Thank you so much, Scott. It is an absolute treat to be here for the first time. This is Fight for the Future's first time participating in this programming. And we are so impressed and really excited to have this many people in the room here on the first evening of Dragon Con to talk about the Delete Act, <laughs> uh, which is very near and dear to um, our hearts because we believe that this legislation uh, will be really powerful in California for harm reduction against data brokers and are hoping for working for advocating very actively for its uh, its passage on the federal level as well so that not just Californians can uh, enjoy its privileges. And so uh, I'll start with a round of intros from everybody. If you could give me name, pronouns, title, affiliation, and we'll go from there. So anyway. Leah Holland, they, she campaigns a comms director with Fight for the Future. Uh, Matthew Lane, senior policy counsel at Fight for the Future. I am Rich Gatz, uh, head of cyber claims at Arch Insurance. I am Amy Stukanovich. I am the vice president, vice president of U.S. policy at the Future Privacy Forum, and I promise I know my title. <laughs> <laughs> Great, so we'll dive right in. Uh, I'm happy to have this be a really participatory panel, so if anybody has questions or things to add in uh, the middle of the conversation, just raise your hand, we'll get a mic get a mic to you, right? That's how this goes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll get a mic to you and uh, make sure that we capture your voice for the audience as well. So uh, my impression, uh, lovely panelists, of the Delete Act is this may be one of the first truly meaningful regulations of data brokers that, uh, that, that we've seen <laughs> pass in California and perhaps be likely to pass on the federal level. And I think we should maybe start out with the basics. What are data brokers? Who are they? What are they, what are they doing and why should we care? I, I could take that, I guess. Um, Everybody here likes social media, maybe. I don't know. Maybe a lot of people do, maybe, maybe a lot of people don't. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard the adage, if you're not paying for something, then what you're providing them you're the is the product. Right? You are the product. Um, and with rampant advancements of technology, we have all these incredible ways to gather data. And you know, humans probably could never take something awesome and and do something terrible with it, but I'm kidding, they totally can. And they did. And so now there's actual for-profit companies whose sole job is to aggregate, collect, purchase your data, and then leverage that data to other third parties, even potentially governments, individuals, whoever, um, so that they can make money from that data. And so these data brokers, they broker your data. And there's lots of ways that um, you know, this data can be sold, right? So um, I think that's a, a pretty high level review, but I mean, it, it, it's pretty simple when you get down to the foundational parts of it. Yeah. One thing worth pointing out, just because um, I think it's relevant to this conversation, is the difficulty of putting all of that into like legal language. Um, because there's a lot there. There's a lot of different ways, different ways that people interact with um, organizations, companies online, a lot of different ways they collect your data. And when you're trying to define the scope of a law like the Delete Act, which um, is, I think, the first law in the country to provide for a mass deletion mechanism um, of your data, then you have to get the framing right. Um, and I think that there are some big questions that are being grappled with the rulemaking stage for this law. Um, that are going to be important to get right because one thing with privacy laws, um, as those of us who have worked in the field for a while know, is um, it can be a long uphill battle sometimes to get privacy laws passed. And when they get passed, you really want them to work properly so people don't get mad about them so that we continue to pass privacy laws. Um, and so I think it's, it's important to think through that technical legal nuance here. Um, I will also just say because it's a personal thing that I, that the adage, if you're not paying for it, you're the product, correct. But I sometimes I hear people think that that means if they are paying for it, that they're not the product. Um, and I also think it's important to realize that sometimes when you are still paying to subscribe or 
um, be a member of a certain community online, that they still likely are collecting data about you. So um, whether or not you are paying doesn't frequently matter. Yeah, just to briefly follow up on Amy's point, um, the universe of data brokers includes not just people that you deal with directly who are collecting and storing your data in a big database, but also um, you know, resellers of that data, people that you have never directly interacted with, third parties. And so um, the universe is quite broad, and uh, that is definitely a challenge for a lot of the different legal definition aspects. Um, and it also includes people who um, uh, sell that data for purposes that, you know, the state and probably most people in the room think that might be necessary, including like uh, credit reporting agencies so that you can get a loan for a house or a car. Um, and so um, that also makes things tricky when trying to write laws, um, which we'll probably get into later. Yeah, I guess the other examples that I might add or specifics that I might point to when we think about the universe of data brokers, it includes everything from folks who are uh, doing credit reporting, but can also include services that are very expensive, like a university education and accessing your academic textbooks and articles and what have you, and having that data potentially tracked and sold, or uh, using a quote, uh, tangentially healthcare app like a, a better help or a um, a lot of these like guided psychedelic trip apps or what, what have you these things that like maybe should be HIPAA protected but aren't uh, it's it's very very broad universe that goes into your browsing data your uh, not just what happens on social media your location data through a variety of apps uh, the, the sheer amount of data that is collected and aggregated oftentimes can lead to things that you thought were anonymous or services that you know maybe only collect like your your zip code and 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 a couple other features but not your name or what have you can then be de-anonymized and linked with other data about you based on the inferences um, that happen so it's uh, that happen with the the data brokers with the AI with how they process and integrate information into a much more full profile of what we uh, do online who we are where we live our whole lives than than one might expect um, it can be pretty all encompassing uh, so with that said California a little bit luckier than the rest of us what does the delete act do exactly and and and, and does it seem like it's going to do it very well um, the Delete Act is a pretty simple bill. It is largely modeled off of the Do Not Call list, which is one of the most popular programs the FTC has ever run. Um, and unfortunately, the Do Not Call list doesn't work anymore because companies have found ways around it and bad actors. But um, for a while, it was it was it was fantastic. Uh, basically, it just it the California version creates a single source deletion request for um, data brokers to basically just opt out across the board saying that like I don't want to be tracked, I don't want my data in a database, um, you're expressing a, a personal preference and all the companies have to respect it. Um, the other sort of aspects are kind of just less important but can be crucial. They have various increased transparency measures and to Amy's point, um, they expanded the definition of data brokers to include a lot of these third parties um, that you don't directly deal with and other things. I think one of the cool parts of this is it actually forces data brokers to register as a data broker. So like currently when you look at the CCPA and the CPRA, <clears throat> like you have you have an opt out, you have a right to deletion, but you have to actually ask it of the, of the company that has your data. So if you're not aware of who's collecting your data or who's using it or leveraging it, it'd be really helpful to like have a list or a centralized repository of those entities that are actually doing so. One of the extra things that I think it's important to call out um, that it, it created disclosures for data brokers that actually are broader than I think any other um, law in the country. So data brokers have to disclose whether they collect data minors, precise geolocation data, reproductive health care data, or reproductive health care data. Um, there were some issues with the law there. Something like reproductive health care data wasn't defined, but 
much broader than, than any laws in states that came before it about what they have to disclose. One other thing that I'd point to that's really exciting um, and that, that's come up a lot in our work recently at Fight for the Future, we've been doing a lot of outreach to abuse survivor support organizations about this law because that community in particular would be very well served by a one-click opt-out from data brokers uh, when a person is, is, is fleeing abuse, trying to start a new life and trying to recover. There is a very real and prescient constant threat from data brokers uh, that they might put up information gleaned about that person's new location, their new address, their new phone number, their new email, and, uh, and, and reveal that to an abuser for uh, sometimes nothing, um, yet, and it's only a Google away. And abuse survivors right now essentially have to constantly monitor whether or not Google <laughs> or any other search engine is showing those sorts of results from data brokers because there is no stay down for the current right to opt out from a company. So if you go to peoplesearch.com or what have you and say, please take down my info, they'll take it down, but they'll also let you know that if they find it from a different source, it may be relisted and put back up again. And so what you get into with that is this endless cycle of whack-a-mole where, yeah, you can ask that it be taken down, you can pay, shell out money for a service like Delete Me, but even Delete Me doesn't, isn't, can't be proactive. They can't say, don't ever put this person's information up. They can only say, hey, now that this is up in public for everybody to see, would you sometime maybe in the next couple of weeks to months or however long your opaque process takes, take it down at some point. Uh, and the Delete Act um, has a stay down clause in it as well, which I find very um, gratifying, uh, especially after hearing some of these stories from some of these organizations that we're working with. Uh, and so I brought up abuse survivors. I'm wondering if we can create or talk, talk through some other communities that this will immediately impact and how it might impact, uh, impact them. If, if you all have examples, or folks in the room have examples that come to mind about who would be really um, potentially very well served by having this sort of service. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the first thing that comes to mind is, you know, lower income communities that are typically marginalized, and you know, um, having the ability to find out everything about a person, even with a cursory Google search or by paying the $1.99 fee to a website um, can basically create um, inadequacies in kind of equal rights and protection. Um, I know that, you know, we've seen it in the healthcare context, we've seen it in, um, obviously, in the lending context, and there's a lot of laws to say, hey, you, you can't discriminate, but at the same time, like, if you get that data, how do you have someone not, not act on it. And this is even more compounded by like AI, right? I had to get that in there at least within the first 15 minutes. Um, <laughs> but you know, with AI and these you know, like different technologies actually making decisions on their own. So how do they make those decisions based upon the, the inquiries and the prompts and the data they're fed? So if they're fed this holistic view of data about a person, and they're a machine, but their prompts are discriminatory, then that extra data that is potentially available for sale can be you know, leveraged to actually make a poor decision. Yes, sir. Um, Two-part question. First, this is a California law that we're talking about. So I'm curious as to what the enforcement mechanisms are if, say, I am a data broker, I'm a data collecting organization, and I don't have a physical presence in California, I'm not headquartered there, I don't have servers in California, maybe not even the United States. But is there a mechanism by which this law can apply? And then my second part of the question is, what are, what are the penalties to a company for violating this law? I, I, I'll go ahead and repeat that question just real quick because we didn't have a mic the whole time. That was a question about enforcement, particularly for out-of-state data brokers, and we caught the second part, so go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I mean, the first part of the question, I, I believe it's based upon if you deal with California customers. 
So it's not where you are, it's are you dealing with customers domiciled in California, which is similar to the CCPA and CPRA with some other restrictions, or I guess, you know, nuance as far as like gross revenue and things like that. Um, but this is gonna be fairly narrow just to data brokers, right? So I would, I would expect, and I think there's been some publications from the regulatory entities that, you know, they would, you know, if you are selling purchasing using Californian domiciled residential data, residence data, and you're a data broker, you will be you know, held you know, under this law. And then what are the penalties? Yeah, penalties. I, did I, I completely blanked on what the fines were, but I believe they are, it's monetary and substantial. Right, it, isn't, it a percent, <laughs> isn't it a percentage of revenue like CCPA, I yeah. believe? So it's not like a, it's not like BIPA where it's like a, a per per fine. There's also no private right of action, right? Like under some privacy frameworks, an individual can sue for a breach of their privacy or the failure to safeguard their personal identifiable information. There's no private cause of action in the Delete Act. Now, if that might change in the future, or if they update the CPRA or CCPA to kind of create one. Um, We'll see. I just want to circle back to Leah's question one time uh, to plug our Do Not Docs website. Um, this is something I've been proud of that Leah and some of our colleagues have worked on um, pretty substantially. And um, basically, I would say that like a lot of the people that benefit from this are people in this room who are relatively private who want to reduce their risk exposure to like have their identity stolen or like reduce the amount of like intrusive ads or just they don't like their to be creeped out by how good the ads are targeting you um but in addition to most of us um there are very specific communities um that need this that like it is life or death and um we've been talking to them and interviewing them and collecting their stories and like right off the bat we uh, have uh, mentioned abuse survivors um Unfortunately, these data brokers allow people to stalk or like dox, as in the popular, popular lingo, uh, a lot of people. Um, we've also heard from a lot of people who are activists or workers in politically targeted um, fields like Planned Parenthood or you know women's health care services around that, um, who you know get threatened, who get stalked, who get harassed, who get their information posted online. Um, you know, including like not high up workers. And so um, we are have sort of highlighted those stories and, and, and focused on that um, primarily because um, the data that is sold by, you know, data brokers sometimes, um, you know, and, and what I would say is definitely a bad business practice to just ordinary people online. Um, the people finders, websites, stuff like that. I mean, that is a substantial tool for these types of activities, and it's a good way in which this information gets out there. And I see we have a question. I'll just throw out also, poll workers are a major concern here. Uh, poll workers often face a lot of doxing and harassment. Uh, we have uh, elders, particularly with scams, AI-powered scams, impersonation, voice scams, and what have you, are, um, generally happen based on data brokers and the webs of relationships that they sell uh, to individuals and uh, veterans as well have been majorly impacted by this as well as active duty service members uh, and we'll go ahead and take that question. Well you were asking uh, what communities would benefit from this. Criminal enterprises, the ability to uh, sweep away their tracks behind them, you know, criminal entity, I would certainly want to use this service. Yeah, I mean, I, I would probably respectfully disagree with, with that because, I mean, if they're a criminal entity using publicly known data brokers, probably not the most super sophisticated. Uh, like, if they're using services, like, you know, for instance, like, I deal with a lot of ransomware threat actors, and it's, you know, we had um, but a fairly large ransom where, for some reason, there was a lot of governmental attention to it, and the threat actor uploaded their Bitcoin to Coinbase, to sell it. Okay, and so it was promptly seized, right? And so, you know, I, 
I, I get where you're coming from, and, and yeah, in some instances, I'm sure there'll be a benefit for it, but um, the tools that law enforcement has, and, and frankly, private enterprise that you know gets a lot of money from law enforcement has, um, I, I wouldn't see that as being like a material issue. I, I want to plus one to something here because I think there are um, a lot of times you see surveillance mechanisms put into law to catch the bad guys, which is something that we should all aim to do, and it is a noble rationale for, for um, considering laws. But you have to consider if those laws that you're talking about are actually going to help catch the bad guys in the long run, because I think frequently the people who know they are doing something illegal or the people who know that there are people who are looking for them have the highest incentive to protect their tracks, talk in code, use certain apps, um, somehow obscure themselves. It's everybody else who might be doing something accidentally, who might have done something in the past. That, like, okay, I'm not going to ask if you all have, but do you all have a friend who might have done something in the past who they might want to maybe let the internet forget about? Like, raise your hand if you have a friend who might have done, yeah? Like, Just remember, kids, the internet's forever. <laughs> so, I, I think that we have to think about the people who are genuinely going to benefit from things and not necessarily try to get to the people who are likely to have already taken steps to um, obfuscate some of their information, which does not speak to the dumb criminals, of which there will always be dumb criminals, much like there will always be dumb people in every category of life. And another consideration that's a little bit newsy, too, is <laughs> The uh, is the recent like national data whatever hack the 2.7 billion records or what have you that were lifted off of some data broker website and the speculation about how many social security numbers were in there uh, what could be done with those social security numbers and the fact that that's kind of a regular thing that happens with data brokers that there's so many of them, they're so underregulated, and there's so few consequences for them collecting all this data and then just accidentally dumping it out on the internet for anybody to use in addition to selling it. Um, or for anybody to, uh, you know, dumping it out on the internet and allowing anybody to take you know, an AI through to look for the most gullible, the most easy to scam, the most easy to impersonate, the most, you know, insert blank here, um, that it, sort of begs the question for me, um, you know, as a privacy rights activist, of whether we're trading everybody's privacy and safety for the chance of catching a bad guy, and whether or not that trade in mass is something that's truly worth it. Um, do we have another question? That's not your question, but adding to the community impact that um, this was something I experienced personally. Uh, this last month, which made me feel incredibly weird. I had a medical emergency near mid to beginning of August. Um, went to the ER, got fixed up and everything. Um, about a week or two later, I started getting random emails and calls and stuff from people trying to be like, hey, you want to sue? Do you want to pursue action? Do you want to do this or that? From a number of individuals I had never even heard of. Um, and I couldn't filter out whether or not it was like people who had gotten my information from a data broker and reaching out, whether or not it was scammers trying to use this as an avenue of attack. Um, couldn't parse any of that. And hope, thankfully it all died away after a little bit of ignoring. But it was incredibly <coughs> predatory. And I could see how someone less knowledgeable or less sensitive to that kind of stuff or even someone, maybe their medical issue was more extensive than mine, and they were desperate for a lawyer of some kind. I could see that really going the wrong way very quickly. Yeah, someone who's vulnerable, someone who's grieving. That reminds me of back in 2015 when my mother passed, and I got letter after letter of, get your inheritance early, scam, or what have you. And like this, the, It felt incredibly predatory. and. Um, that was a very vulnerable time, so, yeah. Yeah, I, I, too. a lower stakes version of that is uh, for anyone that 
is fortunate enough to, to be a home buyer. I mean, we were <laughs> warned that uh, because it's public record that there's a there was a very common scam in our area that uh, someone would mail you and say that you had to get a physical copy of your title, otherwise it wasn't like valid or something like that, and you had to send like 500 bucks to this company, and they would literally just print out a fancy looking copy of a public record and send it to you. We have a question over here. Yeah, let's. Uh, uh, so, uh, so some of the abuses of this kind of data that uh, we've read about in the news over the last few years have been um, bounty hunters reselling real-time location data to stalkers, and more recently, uh, some law enforcement agencies buying access to this data to uh, because it's easier than requesting it from the NSA. Uh, and I'm curious if the Delete Act has any provisions to prevent uh, abuses on the buyer's side versus the uh, just this way of making sure that your own data doesn't end up in those registries. So I, it actually really doesn't. So it's really just an opt-out function for you to opt out with registered data brokers. Yeah, I would just do a quick plug for a bill that has been introduced on the federal level called the Fourth Amendment is Not for Sale Act. It basically, the intention of the bill is to um, force police departments to start getting subpoenas again um, because um, there's a loophole that if you can buy it, the data that you need on the public market, you don't have to get a, a warrant for that very personal information. And so, um, so yeah, that's, that's something that's currently um, existing and does not have much support, but um, there are people that are active. Uh, active on trying to get it passed. And there's like a good harm reduction theory there that like cutting off the supply, you know, <laughs> would, be, would be a good first step, but putting the onus on individuals to know that something like the Delete Act opt out exists even in California. Like, I, I, none of my California friends know that this, this thing passed. They don't know it exists. Well, I mean, it, it's interesting yeah. though. I mean, following obviously GDPR in, in the EU and then CCPA in California, we've seen a huge increase in states with fully fledged privacy regulatory frameworks. I think we're up to like 13 or 14 at this point. And when CCPA was first passed, I think there was like two. Right? I think CCPA was really one, but Massachusetts had pretty, pretty has pretty extreme privacy. Uh, believe it or not, because my policyholders get sued all the time there. Um, but you know, it, it really does kind of slowly start to change how states look at legislation. I mean, up until I want to say maybe four or five years ago, there was three or four states that didn't even have laws for data breaches. Like there was no notification requirement if you lost, had stolen like customer data. Now all 50 states have it, right? And there's a federal privacy <laughs> law somewhere in Congress. We're not sure exactly where or what's going to happen to it. But you know that's something that was hasn't really been contemplated before really California started upping their game in the US. And that's a good point too is that like I think folks up here would agree largely that the data the, the, the delete act is kind of a band-aid for the fact that we don't have any sort of meaningful federal data privacy legislation here in the US that if we did likely the business model of these data brokers wouldn't really be quite so viable. Um, and, 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 and that's one of the conversations that we've had with a lot of frontline communities or folks that are really invested in federal data privacy and, and making sure that not just this business model, but business models like this aren't possible anymore when they're so harmful and so exploitative and that really like the final boss is data privacy. I saw more questions over here. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious as to how far this goes in terms of removing information. Um, smart people can disagree, but I would make the argument that there are certain things one shouldn't be able to scrub from the internet. For instance, if one is a violent criminal and has a record of that, or say hypothetically you used to write uh, opinion pieces for Stormfront, that should remain available, I would argue. Um, what happens in those sort of cases and is it addressed by this legislation? So, I mean, you're, again, we want to look at what this bill targets, and it's only data brokers. Yeah. So, like, the Internet Archive, things like that, 
you know, I guess Google doesn't really cache websites anymore, but you know, there's going to be mechanisms to see a lot of the, the terrible things that people have done on the internet, whether it's you know embarrassing or you know, racism. Um, you know, because the internet still is forever, right? Uh, but this is solely tailored to data brokers, how they, you know, if they're aggregating your information and if they're potentially using your information within their population of data that they're selling to others. Yeah, it's a it's an incredibly simple bill, and that it is just allowing people to express a preference to a very targeted group of businesses that just collect and create databases of your data. So, like all the primary sources, like they're still there. That's it's, the detail I was missing. I, yeah. I I think it's it's slight. I'm going to slightly tweak what you said because the definition of data broker is um, like a company that doesn't collect information from the person directly. But it's not only the information the company doesn't collect from the person directly. And I think this is why I get, when I talked originally about legal nuance and the importance of language, this is where it comes in. Because there are a lot of companies that you choose to interact with, that you provide data to. Um, I don't, how many have an online photo database or a social media account or something that you use on a regular basis? That might also, that company that provides that service might also have um, be pr collecting information about you from third parties. So they are acting as a data broker within the definition of data broker, and then they have information they have from you firsthand. The issue is, is that that deletion request would apply to, at current to both categories of data. So if you go to um, exercise your deletion right and say, I want all of these companies to delete all of my data, and all of a sudden then you sign into your photo account and all of your pictures are gone, that's going to be a consequence you might not have expected or wanted. And we need to be able to kind of go in at this stage, at the stage where we're looking at regulations at clarifying the scope of the law to make sure it is aligning with expectations, that it's not actually applying to all of the data um, that is collected, but perhaps only the data that is truly collected in that third party capacity that you're not providing directly to the company. And that's the process that's happening right now in California. Like, I, my, I believe that the opt out mechanism doesn't happen, doesn't launch until 2026. That's being mm -hmm. built now, um, and, and all of these, these impacts are being worked out amongst the smart people. Correct? Mm -hmm. Hopefully. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've heard secondhand that there is a challenge in implementation that is being ironed out. So, is there any smart engineers or people in the room? Go work for the government. Yeah. Uh, I think they're even just looking for people to advise them at this point. But, because um, it, it is a technical back end. Um, like, I, I, assuming that they're going to build out APIs and other things so that data brokers databases can connect to the California database and so there's there's like a need for engineering so I, I do want to correct something that I said earlier in regards to the monetary penalties so I was looking up something else just to make sure that um, I was on point and it, it's great because in, in the perfect language of government legalese it, it may subject data brokers to administrative fines which we, there's no further explanation of that. Fees, expenses, and costs, including a $200 a day fine for each deletion request that goes unanswered and each day that the broker falls out of compliance. Hey, um, so I, I actually work in the privacy space and help companies do this stuff. Um, so, Godspeed to whoever has to implement this because I don't think anyone, if you're not in the space, you don't understand how difficult this actually is. Um, I deal with technical teams that are like dialed in, understand how this works, and they, they're shipping data off to third parties not knowing. Like they don't know that they're even, that they're even doing this. So something as simple as, you know, an online help, um, on your website is now complete data tracking and has shipped your data to the universe. Um, so it's a, it's a very difficult problem. It's hard. You have to get to the roots of it. So 
Godspeed to the people who are going to be working on that because I'm including myself. Um, <laughs> but I, I wanted to go back to the, the question of community. Um, I think everyone here probably agrees that CCP, CCPA, GDPR, CIPRA are all are like focusing on the California laws because the guy who passed that is like a former BlackRock MD, right? He benefits from it. So I don't care. I don't care who the communities are. I just want it passed. Like, I just want to be clear. Everybody benefits from it. And just because you're a BlackRock MD and wealthy and can literally pay people to go fix things for you doesn't mean that you don't have the right to privacy. You have the right to privacy. You should have a right to privacy. And, you know, that's that's really where it ends up. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor or smart or dumb or elderly or young, you should have the right to privacy. And, you know, I think trying to, I mean, it, it helps us understand through analogy, the communities, but everybody deserves this. Hell yeah. Um, I think that I point to communities or focus on communities because of the storytelling component of it and, and you know, in our analysis and talking to legislators and what have you. Unfortunately, on the federal level, to try to get this thing passed, there is a certain amount of pandering. And so if you've got a member who is really into veterans, or if you've got a member who really cares about abuse survivors, then we bring, you know, our, our, our thought is let's bring those stories to the member who's going to sign on for that community that they care about. But that brings us to talking a little bit more about the federal piece here and what might be needed to push that forward. Uh, does anybody want to talk a little bit of where, about where the Federal Delete Act is at and what the next steps might be towards just giving that thing legs? I think Amy and I have both been working on this. Maybe Amy more than me, but I don't know if you want to take it first or if you want to just... <laughs> I. Um, it's kind of a mess right now. So uh, the Delete Act politically was um, stalled based on a bill called APRA, uh, and that was sort of the main vehicle to take care of like comprehensive privacy. It was a like it wasn't massive in terms of what's needed, but it was massive in terms of like the Congress's ability to deal with complicated and technical things. <laughs> uh, and so, um, so obviously there's, there was a lot of trouble with it. Um, there was a very, uh, there was a coalition that was very finely held together and that coalition collapsed based on politics. And so APRA collapsed. Um, and uh, so uh, we thought that that might mean the lead act was moving, but uh, unfortunately APRA won't even have a quick death, it's having a slow death, and so we are still kind of waiting for that. Uh, and this is sort of the, the, the not fun part of being a swamp creature is um, uh, that things get very messy in ways that you sometimes don't have control over. But the one good piece of news, if you care only about the Delete Act, about APRA dying, is, is that APRA contained a very weak version of the Delete Act in it. Uh, there was no universal opt-out, and the maximum fine was something like capped at 5000 a year, which everyone I talked to said that, like, that that is like so substantially lower than the cost of even just trying to get an engineer to work on this compliance that like everyone's going to pay five grand a year. So um, so yeah, so that is the one piece of good news. Um, but otherwise, uh, it is it is popular and not moving, which is one of the most frustrating things to say about something that is going on in DC. Um, a lot of offices that I personally talk to like it, um, there is some bickering and negotiation around the edges, but um, I think that it is seen as needed. The other sort of piece of this is that um, California is a bit of a test bed, and so there is potentially folks that want to just wait and see what happens there, and especially to kind of crib notes on implementation, um, which is you know challenging, and so um, that. Uh, in a way is good, um, technically good governance, um, trying to you know, do 
do things right, but also it's going to take time, which is unfortunate. Um, Amy, I don't know if you want to fill in anything. I'm sure I missed plenty. And, and that was not a, a laugh at Matt at all. That was, um, I, I have by no means been around for every single federal privacy law fight, um, but I remember um, when there was a member of Congress by the name of Joe Lieberman who introduced comprehensive federal privacy law. I remember um, the federal um, privacy bill of rights that President Obama championed. I remember <laughs> all the way through the um, Americans' Privacy Rights Act that um, was um, championed by a coalition of organizations this year. And for each round, with good reason, I think people get very excited that we might finally have a federal comprehensive privacy law in the US. Um, back when I started this, there weren't a lot of federal or comprehensive privacy laws globally. Um, now there are many um, and the U.S. has demonstrably fallen behind the rest of the world in terms of protecting um, privacy rights of its citizens um, to the extent that actually we got an executive order this year um, from the White House that is trying to fix a national security concern that has arisen from a lack of privacy protections by limiting transfers of personal information um, held in private companies to specific countries of concern. Um, that are, are being suspected of utilizing that information um, to gain um, security, in, in, gain um, a, a edge over the U.S. from a, from a national security perspective. So um, I think that we really need to be talking in D.C. about the need for a comprehensive privacy law. I still think it is vitally important as we see more and more states pass comprehensive privacy laws. Um, it seems like we might be reaching this point where, like we did with data breach laws, where now we're at 50 states and Congress is a little bit apathetic about why would we pass this? All of the states have protections. Um, for a while, it was looking like the states would really um, <clears throat> su support comprehensive privacy legislation by the fact that so many states were doing it. Congress would step in. Um, we have not necessarily seen that really move forward in a serious way since, and um, the pressure needs to be on in D.C. to do this. Um, it would probably, if I was to like look into my crystal ball during an election year, at a time when we're having trouble funding the federal government, my money would not be on it being 2025, but my hope would. Um, that does not mean that we stop. Or, uh, 2024. Wow, I fast forward this forward a year. 2024. I still think you're right, though. Yeah. <laughs> still right. We can look Probably. ahead to 2025, 2026, um, and and you put the framework, the infrastructure in place now for the conversations that are going to happen in those future years. Yeah, and one of the classic conundrums in DC is when you have so much that needs to be done. Do you wait until you can do it all, or do you start taking off bites beforehand to get the important stuff out of the way, the simpler stuff? And I personally would just have a small pitch for incrementalism because, like, Delete Act is like a uh, a pretty good backstop on harm while we wait. Um, I know some people don't agree with me, but um, but I do think it's important that we pass um, the quote unquote easier. <laughs> Um, aspects of, of privacy while we wait for the more complicated. I have a question. Uh, I work in uh, medical billing, uh, so that's why I'm at this panel. <laughs> and um, I just have a lot of concerns because of the stuff that I do day to day, seeing how many times we copy. Uh, patient data, uh, which includes obviously, you know, personally identifiable, identifiable information. We have HIPAA that uh, you know regulates uh, some bits of this, um, but it's far from comprehensive. And just for you know, uh, completely above board legal reasons, we have to retain a lot of our records for quite a long time, um, even just due to contractual relationships we have with other companies. How would this impact that? I mean, how how would we you know, let's say we 
get everything that we want uh, implemented. We fast forward 10 years after that, would it even be possible to continue billing people in the way that we do if somebody can just request that all of their data be removed? So the definition of data broker, I'm gonna read it to you, and this is what I was looking up earlier when I, I found my mistake, is it's the same definition as in the CCPA. A business that knowingly collects and sells to third parties, and I think you said this exact same thing earlier, the personal information of a consumer with whom the business does not have a direct relationship. So, you guys have a direct relationship. Now, if you started aggregating third-party customer health data in order to make your platform more efficient or whatever, and you were purchasing that, or even worse, you became like a CRM provider or something, and you were purchasing data and then selling the data, then there might be some applicability. But I, I don't think you'd be a data broker as under the CCPA. Uh, We, we actually would fall into that definition uh, pretty, pretty roundly for a variety of reasons. Um, so, and again, I mean, my company, to the best of my knowledge, does nothing illegal. Uh, there's nothing, uh, you know, that they really do that is uh, even questionable, really. Uh, we are more in the realm of coordinating a lot of the billing. Oh, okay. And so I, I assumed you were like a health insurance provider. So you no, were dealing no, direct it's, with... We're dealing directly with the doctors. We're not dealing directly with the patients at all. Uh, we have no interaction with patients whatsoever, but we are... You know, given that data, we transform that data and then sell it off to other So, people. yeah, I still think you wouldn't apply because the, the customer relationship, the entity, the individual whose PHI you're reviewing, they'll typically file file a release form to allow their health, private health yeah. information to be shared for purposes right. of billing, blah, 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 blah. So you're not purchasing that data and then you're not selling it unless yeah. there's some nuance to your business. I'm not aware of because I just met you 30 years sure. ago. Sure. <laughs> 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 I understand completely. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I mean, it, it's an interesting question, and I think yeah. I think to your point, you know, if you can ask questions like this, there's going to be a ton of questions. And even yeah. though this is a fairly simple act, which I think these two or these three could probably explain much more than I can. Um, you know, there's still going to be a lot of nuance and you know regulatory inquiries and, and things like that to understand who really is applicable to. Yeah, you. I, no, I, I appreciate it. I will say that like simple is a relative term. <laughs> Great. And so I, I like this is uh, across the board in all tech policy definitions are near impossible to write. Um, and so, and, and on either side there are problems. Uh, I'll just give you a quick story. Um, there is in the Federal uh, Delete Act an exemption for um, data brokers that collect and sell data to credit bureaus as part of the Credit Reporting Act because, you know, again, that is considered to be something that is a very useful and necessary use of data and data brokers. Um, I had heard a story from someone that uh, there was a data broker going around saying that because part of their business is selling data to credit bureaus, then all of their business is exempt. And, you know, like a good activist uh, lobbyist, I ran around and told every office that I could that that was um, a, an interpretation that some data brokers are having, and I think that that definition might be fixed. But I think on the, you know, on the other side, I think that there is valid reason to get those definitions right. And this is, again, across the board a problem with um, tech policy is, is that the law of big numbers, there's so much business and transaction and interaction and everything that like the marginal cases are significant. And so writing something that's perfect is just hard, and that's why a lot of times you hand it off to like the FTC or regulatory body, and their job is to make sure that it is like enforced in good faith in the way that's intended. I have another question. Sorry, this is more a question of clarification um, of the scope of the Delete Act, and the, again, I know we've been over this topic a number of times at this point, the definition of data broker. Um, it was brought up at one point, maybe an entity is acting both as a data broker and a service provider at the same time. I think an easy example, probably Google. You have a Google account, you have Google Drive, you have Google Photos, 
Google Sheets, you have Google Workspace. Google obviously also acts as a data broker. They sell third-party information, they purchase third-party information all the time. Um, as someone who, like many people, has a Google account and uses it extensively, uh, I have opted in to share and let them deal with my personal information in some matters. Um, I like better search results, for instance, and giving them more personal information and opting into that makes my life easier. Um, I would like to use the Delete Act because there's a lot of unknown data brokers that obviously have my data. So this puts a weird conundrum where I would like to make use of the Delete Act, I would like to delete a whole bunch of data, I would like to keep my Google account, I would like to also be able to opt in to some data brokers because it makes my life easier with their services. Any commentary on, on this? So I think what Leah said earlier about the fact that this um, comes into effect in 2026, so there is time um, to make sure that the provisions, um, the regulations that the California Privacy Protection Agency, CPPA, sometimes they get California acronyms all messed up. The CPPA puts into place makes sense. Um, I think the ones that they recently <coughs> proposed, FPF commented on them, are going to, as I said earlier, explained earlier, create a lot of um, results when people put in a delete act request that people don't expect, including having data that they want at a company they have chosen to interact with deleted. Um, there is time to adjust for that. Another thing that it does that we have flagged in our comments is it creates a um, time-bound relationship. So after three years, you are no longer considered to have a direct relationship with a company. Um, I know at least I have companies that I don't log into or look at for a long period of time sometimes. I don't necessarily want to sever my relationship after that period of time. Um, we've recommended that they look into alternative mechanisms. So for instance, in Colorado, um, they use a, a requirement of renewed consent. If you haven't logged in for 24 months, they have to seek your consent again to continue keeping your information, but it doesn't automatically just stop after three years. So these are a couple things that we've picked out that I think will have unintended consequences for people, but there's time to fix them. Um, and we're going to continue to engage in this regulatory process, I'm sure others will as well, toward that, um, so that it works well for the uh, many, many poor individuals who are going to have to put in place the compliance mechanisms for that. Um, Thank you. Godspeed. Um, for the people who want to use it, we really want this to um, be able to be complied with and be able for people to interact with in a way that they want to be able to interact with it. And doesn't that also fall into being a direct relationship again? Like if you have a direct relationship with Google, then Google isn't a data broker is covered by the act. They, but if they, the date, the delete mechanism oh, doesn't only a, so you have a direct relationship for some information, you don't have it for some information, which means they fall into the data broker definition by virtue of the fact that they have information that was not collected through a direct relationship. And then the delete mechanism is not only limited to that information that they didn't obtain through a direct relationship, it actually applies to all of the information, even the information they gathered through the direct relationship. So by virtue, they come into the data broker definition by virtue of having non-direct data. And then once they come into it, it applies to all of the data they would have. Got it. So just to break that down a little bit further, um, does that then mean that they, like would the Delete Act then block them from just selling that data to other people or from having that data at all or from acquiring that data from other places or some combination of the three. So it would require them to delete the data when the delete request came in, which means if you have a photo drive with Google, they would have to delete the third party data, the stuff that they bought about you and potentially all of the photos in your drive because that's also information about you. And they would have to do that on a rolling 45-day basis until you said that you no longer wanted them to do that anymore. Um, so it's a matter of just having the delete mechanism tied to the type of data, not just to the entity itself. Cool. Uh, we have more, yeah, there we go, there's another question. 
So, two observations. One, this is sounds less like a delete act and more of a third party data broker uh, uh, regulation act. Yeah. Right? So, truth in advertising might help. Secondly, uh, the overturn of the Chevron decision uh, kind of vacates the whole, uh, well, we'll just let the federal regulatory agencies uh, hash out the meanings of these, uh, of, of these uh, terms. So you're going to have to really precisely define your terms in the actual legislation because you, you have no deference to the regulatory agencies uh, 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 making decisions about it. And I'm hearing dissonance just between the four of you about who does what and who has to delete what. And then it brings a, a third issue of how much data are we talking about and how comprehensive does the find and kill mechanisms have to be to implement it. Can so, I take that one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's get some audience answers. The average mid-sized enterprise has between 95 and 180 SaaS companies that they work with. What's a and SaaS company? A so software as a service company. So that's your Salesforce. Mm -hmm. It's um, basically all of the most modern software is SaaS in some aspect. So when you start to think about the amount of data that gets shipped around, go look at a website and like open like. Uh, 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 you know, you can open up the dev tools in Chrome and literally look at all the requests that happen and watch all of the network requests that are happening. And you literally see like a, a tool like Drift, which is owned by Twilio. Twilio is a marketing company that does, sends SMS messages. Drift literally is just like ping, 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 ping. There's your IP address. There's every piece of data that they have about you and everything. And they don't even mean to keep this data. They don't even, they don't, they have no, like, drift, I'm reasonably certain, doesn't actually have any intent to be like, we're going to third party broker all of them. Eventually, the private equity will get to them and that's what they'll do. But that. It's well, more expensive it's to get rid of the data than it is to keep it. But the, but. Unless you're a data broker. But so there's a whole. Right. This, I'm, I'm cringing listening to this because I deal, I actually deal with, like, customers who, are actually trying to implement CIPRA and CPR, you know, and GDPR. And, you know, if there are N lawyers in the room, you'll have N plus some number of opinions about, well, fine, then we'll delete everything. We don't care. If you submit a, you know, a GDPR change request, we're deleting all of your data. We're not going to touch any of it. You, are, you have committed yourself to being fissile material. We are putting you in the Nevada desert buried. I don't think they can get it. I don't think they can find it all. Well, oh, so they, can get, they can get it, but the problem is there's not, the, to do the nuance is really hard. Well, and you don't want to do nuance, right? Right, it, you don't want to do when nuance because it's wanting to delete data. So as someone that's helped draft, um, maybe similar to you, privacy policies for startups and larger companies specifically to make them CCPA and GDPR compliant, okay, you want to err on the side of the toughest, strictest rule in any jurisdiction you work in, which in the privacy context is GDPR. Some, right? some lawyers disagree with you. Well, and then, well, I would argue that they're terrible lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because the thing is, is, I mean, GDPR, CCPA, we're getting a little bit beyond the field here, does have a revenue fine component up to three to four percent of your gross, right? Not your net expenses, your gross expenses. So when you're looking at a company that's become newly, com has, has to be newly compliant, right? You want to err, they also call it privacy by design, right? Like you want to err on the side of, okay, you get a deletion request, okay, you go through your process, you do everything you can, you delete everything, you go new scorched earth. Because gosh forbid that individual somehow gets one more marketing email after they make that request and submits it to a data protection you know agency in the EU or the regulatory body in California, um, you're looking at a whole world of hurt. And so as we wrap up here, I would say that what we've seen in this conversation is the approach to trying to iron out some really hairy stuff. This is not easy. This is a simple law and. 
as we see, it's anything but simple. Uh, but our position, I think the position of everybody on this, this table and many in the room, is that um, just because it's difficult doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it and that the harms that are happening here are very real. They are life or death for a lot of people. And, um, and that there are different people taking different roles, like what the Future Privacy Forum is doing and engaging in is very different than what Fight for the Future is doing, is very different than what the Electronic Frontier Foundation is doing. And, uh, and, and that this is like comprehensively a group effort where people are playing different positions. And, uh, and, and that it's really, it's really exciting to work with different organizations and learn from them on that and to keep pushing forward within our, our playing field at Fight for the Future. And so in that spirit, um, I want to plug for Fight where you can learn more, follow our work, engage in this effort. Um, and if anybody else has anything to plug or share, please um, let us no, um, in this, this last minute here. Uh, so we have do not docs.com, uh, which is our flagship website for the idea of a do not call list for data brokers. Um, there's a sub web, and there you'll see, I think it's 30 or 40 individual civil and human rights organizations at this point that have endorsed um, that concept. And then we have do not docs.com slash call where you can call your legislators, see even more organizations who specifically endorse the Delete Act. And uh, you can also go to fightforthefuture.org where we have an email list um, on these and other topics. Is there anything else people like to plug to so that folks can stay tuned on more Delete Act action? Bio comments, if you're so inclined. This is an important time to make sure that they get this right. So if you are an interested party, um, I encourage you to engage in the political process and um, help us make sure that um, the law makes sense. Yeah, can I, I, I just plus one that um, I think that obviously this is a resource intensive endeavor and the more likely, the more important it is, the more likely um, the government and everyone else is to go through the exercise. So more popular, the more necessary it seems, the better. And so yes, I would definitely encourage everyone to express their preference. And I want to just make one Chevron point, and I have purposefully avoided a lot of Chevron, so I'm going to be really light on my answer to what I know to be true. But um, it, it, it's not like a complete collapse of the administrative state. Like agencies, are, their entire point is to be experts on things and to develop policy. Um, it does change the way the laws have to be written, yes. Um, it also removes deference, which just means that courts can overturn them easier as when they can't do things. So that's, that's all I'll say about Chevron until I read up more on it, which I'm sure I'll have an assignment to do that soon. <laughs> yeah, have fun with that. Um. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with that, uh, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up. I will say I have Fight for the Future goodies. You should come talk to us. Um, you want some and yeah we just really appreciate the time and space to talk about this it's a uh, it's really great stuff in the right direction and we're all working real hard to to make something actually good happen legislatively so thank you all for joining us